natural for me to do the human interest stuff, and I just stayed with it. Ken Stiller used to say, you, you've got to get him away from that television set with your fiction. Well, it, it's a terrible thing to put on a poor illustrator's back. That's got my money. some time trying to live that middle name down. He was a city boy, born in Manhattan, and he played on city streets. They didn't have much money, and like most people then, didn't own an automobile. But they'd walk up to Amsterdam Avenue, get an open trolley, put the cushions down, and take a ride up to Van Cortlandt Park. Norman would laughingly say, gee whiz, it was another world. And Norman Rockwell came to Arlington. He was just coming out of a, a very difficult time in his life. He had been to Europe, and he had struggled, and he was looking for some way of expressing himself to capture his, his painting again. It wasn't the country, really, that he liked that much. What he liked was the people that were there. They were great rustic types, which he liked. The clothes looked as though they had been worn. Uh, that's one of the reasons he left New Rochelle, was getting uh, very suburban, and he said, all the kids look too well dressed to be here. Somehow, when he came to Arlington, his paintings started to flourish again. In seemingly inevitable fashion, the cover of the Saturday Evening Post and Norman Rockwell's familiar signature became identified as one voice in America's consciousness. And it was a voice that called people home. Norman Rockwell, the move to Arlington. in Vermont. This was the place, and the early 1940s was the time when Norman Rockwell made his official personal transition to small town America. My husband and I were in real estate 42 years, and Bert placed an ad in a New York paper, and Norman and Mary read it, and it appealed the little old farmhouse on the Batten Hill, and they wrote for an appointment the day that they came to inspect the property, they purchased it with the idea they bring the three boys for summers only. But after the end of the first summer, they so loved Arlington and the people in it that they sent for their furnishings in New Rochelle, New York, and they moved here permanently. And they were with us for 14 years. Previously, his hand was on the pulse of rural gatherings and local activities from his studio in New Rochelle, a suburb of New York City. But now remarried, he had found a new home, a new family, and a new peace within himself and with his work. He inhaled the crisp air of the countryside and seemed to mix pure mountain water into his paints. He also relied more and more on his neighbors for inspiration, as models, and for advice. As was his custom, Norman used all his neighbors as models. Boys, girls, there was almost no one in town he didn't paint. But the sun was setting on this new life, and dramatic changes were shaping for both Rockwell and the peaceful America 
Eastville Church. to this was taken in Troy, New York. Norman went down to Troy and he took the background and the picture and uh, he came back and we, we posed in the studio. And the soldier that's coming home is my brother. And this little girl right there is me. Where his early work for the Saturday Evening Post contained a heavy dose of light humor, the post-war years are where Rockwell developed even more explicitly humorous cover concepts. Sometimes with what could be called captionless cartoons in oil. This is my my father right here, and here's my mother, and then here I am blowing the bubble. Oh, for heaven's sake! He came to me and he said, "Can you blow a bubble gum? Blow bubble?" And I said, "Sure, I can blow a bubble, but before I do, you got to go to the store and get me some new bubble gum." And my mom right here. She was really angry at me because she used to do housework for him. And uh, she said, you don't ask people for bubble gum, so you just don't be so bold. <laughs> did he get you some? Yes, he sure, sure did. <laughs> what the comic strip thing did is uh, add to the cover uh, the passage of time. Uh, in other words, this, this is a whole series of events in this marvelous cover of Norman's built around the theme of gossip, which can't all occur at once. In other words, they start going through, and this lady talks to this lady, and that lady talks to the man, the man laughs, and he tells it to someone else. 
And it goes on down. This is Norman's uh, second wife, Mary. This fellow is a fellow we met up in the little uh, Rockwell Museum in Arlington. He uh, gave you some kind of an idea with his own facial expression what uh, what he wanted. Was he a wonderful actor? Yes, he certainly was. Mom. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I tried helping him as much as possible uh, in my natural way. And Rockwell put himself down oh, here yeah. as sort of the butt of the gossip, and there again, he did that just to emphasize the fact that if he was going to poke fun at anybody else in town in the picture, his friends, that he would certainly poke the most fun at himself. And there's Lester over here. He doesn't look that much different now. I always thought this was one of the best magazine covers I'd ever seen. Thus, working together, Rockwell and Stewart introduced a new aspect to Rockwell's post-war work. Not merely stories implied by one image, but rather sequential graphic narratives always a chronicle of the time, always an indelible portrait of Americans. The steady brush of the master, always succeeding far beyond any suggestion, far beyond the photos he implemented in his own search for truth. expanded, many Americans were on the move once more, seeking a better lifestyle in the small town environment that Rockwell portrayed so well. My name is Mary Whalen, and when I was 12 years old in Arlington, Vermont, I posed for this picture. And it's always warmed my heart over the years because this is considered to be one of Norman Rockwell's favorites as well as the public's favorite. And certainly, it captures a, a very wonderful moment in a young person's life. But there is that time when a young person dreams about who they are and who they're going to grow up to be, and maybe how wonderful and beautiful they're going to be in life. Norman got so excited trying to get this foolish grin on my face that at one point he was down on the floor on his hands and knees, banging the floor with laughter. And he knew instantly when he got the right shot. But the early 50s brought painful change to the Rockwell household. Because of his wife Mary's illness, the family decided to move from Arlington to Stockbridge, Massachusetts, some 50 miles away, but close enough so that she could receive the best of care. Despite his deep concerns for his wife, Rockwell's heavy output did not slacken at all. The Rockwell legacy Continues. This happens to be the original of the first cover I did. I don't know this rare was. interview with Norman took place on a chilly evening in 1958. The famous interviewer, Edward R. Murrow. The program, CBS's Person to Person. Where do you get your ideas? That painting of the jury room, for Well, this particular idea was see up about seven years ago. I lived in Vermont, and I was on a jury up there. And uh, we had one man who just, uh, he just wouldn't vote with us there. Early in the afternoon, we had all decided, except this one man, that the party was guilty. But uh, he wouldn't uh, vote with us. And then finally, at 12 o'clock, when the village church rang out 12 o'clock, all of a sudden he said, I'm voting with you. And we said, well, why are you suddenly changed 12 o'clock? Well, he said, don't you realize it's 12 o'clock, we get another $10 for the next day. <laughs> so then we all went to bed. Like this. Mm -hmm.
what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. The 1960s marked a new era in American history. The new frontier of President Kennedy heralded widespread feelings of new beginnings, new attitudes. But serious and dramatic changes were in the wind. The problems and issues that were sublimated in the 1950s finally rose to the surface. He was more and more called on by the magazines, especially the Post, in the later 60s to use current events themes. So he was called on to do portraits of Jack Kennedy. Here is uh, one he did in 1960, then again in 63, and for the memorial issue of Kennedy's assassination, the Post reused the earlier picture they had used in 1960. One of the reasons he decided on separating his ties with the Post was that during the last year, he was called on just to do portrait work, which he really wasn't happy with. He wanted to do other issues and scenes of the day. So then during the Stockbridge years, as you can see, he did anything and everything that was happening. He did the Peace Corps stories. He did integration. He did the space missions. And he even did such uh, wonderful scenes as the uh, springtime in Stockbridge. I think that the, the America today is tremendously interested in the issues of today. I think. And I think that when the illustration comes back, it'll be people that will do these things that have a, a certain, not just a clever technique, but a really absorbed feeling about what they're doing, you know, you know what they're trying to say. Rockwell was to comment, I work from fatigue to fatigue. At my age, there's only so much daylight left. But he painted to the end. On November 8, 1978, Norman Rockwell passed from this earth, leaving behind him a portrait of America as we would always wish it to be. Kindly, caring, generous, and as loving as this humble genius had so tenderly portrayed him for so many, many years.